Okay. So I will take a look at these assignments. I'll get the grades posted online uh, today. And remember that uh, we're going to be using iLearn for the grade book, and so you can always check your, uh, your grade at any time there. It'll be up to date. Um, the recordings that I do for the lectures, I'll usually post those within um, maybe one or two hours of class being finished if you want to review them. Uh, sometimes during the semester, we're going to have a few class periods where it would be useful to have access to Microsoft Excel. So how many of you have a laptop or a tablet computer that you could bring into class if we needed to use Excel? It seems like most everybody. All right, great. That'll make it easier for us to, uh, to solve some of those problems. I'll teach you the long way to do it by hand, and then I'll show you the easy way with Excel, and you'll be so grateful that Microsoft makes that program, because it'll make your life a lot easier. Yes? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Don't bring, it every, don't bring it every week or you'll have a spine problem. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll let you know in advance. Let's take a look at a few announcements here. Um, the introductory assignment I've collected already. Like all assignments, it'll be due at the beginning of class. Uh, homework 2 is, um, is going to be due on Tuesday, the 15th of September. And so um, we've got, a, I guess that's a week, right, for you to finish that assignment. Um, it is mostly covering some of the problem-solving type stuff that we're going to do today. And so um, getting started early on this will give you the advantage of plenty of time to ask questions if you have any. And so I encourage you, don't wait until uh, Monday night at 9 p.m. to start working on it. If you, work on, if you work on it at the last minute, then it'll be a disaster. But if you start on it early, everything will go smooth and you'll be relaxed. So, all right. And then, um, last time in class, I gave you the course schedule. If you missed class last time, all of that information is posted online. The schedule, the policies, and the syllabus are all posted on iLearn. And the first quiz of the semester will be on Thursday the 17th. And so, the content of that quiz. It'll include everything until that lecture with an emphasis on the homework assignment. So if you know how to do the homework assignment well, then you'll be in good shape for the quiz that happens the next class period. So any questions about the uh, announcements before we go on? Okay. Let's just uh, review where we were when we had to finish on Sunday. Uh, we we're talking about mass balance. And um, so the easiest way to illustrate the importance and the application of mass balance is to use the example of a container, like a tank. Everyone here, I think, has taken fluid mechanics. And so if we have a tank of water, and we have a pipe where water is flowing in, and also we have a pipe where water is flowing out. What this relationship says is that inside of the container, you'll have an accumulation of mass based on the difference between what flows in and what flows out. So let me ask you this. If the flow rate in is bigger than the flow rate out, What's going to happen to the water level in the tank? Right, so there will be a positive accumulation. So in this case, what we would say is water accumulates in the tank. And by the way, I'll remind you that the reason I print the slides this way, where you have the slides on one side and the blank space on the other, it's just so that you can write what I'm doing on the whiteboard on the side. Unfortunately, I'm recording this video right now. You'll hear my voice, but you'll only see the slide. This isn't a smart classroom. And so what I do on the whiteboard, um, will only, you'll only have that if you record it by your own hand, unfortunately. Okay, so water accumulates in the tank if in is bigger than out. And so if we look at the formula there, that makes sense. If in is larger than out, there's a positive accumulation. All right. What about if out 
is larger than N. Obviously, the water level is going to go down if you have more water coming out of the tank than in. So according to this formula, what we would say is um, there is a negative accumulation in the tank. And so out in is small, out is big, so the net term, it's going to be a negative value, and so a negative accumulation is like a decrease. A negative accumulation. All right, so this is the basics of mass balance, and what we've been working with so far is assuming that there's no reactions. And in the case of a water tank, if it's just water going in and water going out, there's no reaction there. Later on, we're going to start talking about what if there's a chemical reaction inside of the tank? But so far, there's no chemical reaction. It's just inert substances accumulating. Any questions so far? You can ask questions anytime. Don't feel like you're interrupting or that it's a problem. I really like to have student questions. And so please, I, I welcome your feedback and your questions. All right, let's look at a natural system. We started by talking about a tank like a, a man-made structure, but what about in nature? How can we apply this process in nature? And so, what are the inflows and the outflows? I really like this nice eraser that they've got for us in the classroom. It's like a little piece of felt. So I'm going to, uh, to use that and be glad that it's here. It's better than my hand, I guess. All right. So let's go through this picture and analyze it. Let's analyze this picture, find the in and the out. All right. So what is the tank, first of all? Like the equivalent, uh, the place where mass is being stored. Mass is stored in the lake. If we were going to apply Reynolds transport theorem, which you learned in civil engineering 240 fluid mechanics, like you draw a line around something. You draw a line around something and you're keeping track of what flows in and what flows out. So here, you draw the control surface around the lake. So the lake is where we're keeping track of the in and the out. Okay, so how does water come into the lake? All right, the rain, rain onto water surface. Okay, so some of the water will rain directly onto the lake. But then what this is showing is that the rain on the land is causing flow through the river. And so there's also flow from the river. Okay. Can you see any other inflows to the reservoir or to the lake? That's right. Groundwater is both going in and going out of the lake. And that picture doesn't show it very realistically. A better representation maybe would be, let's say we have a mountain like this. And on the mountain is a lake. So here's the, here's the water in the lake right here. Um, if it rains on top of the mountain, it'll have a water table that's perched so that groundwater flows into the lake and then groundwater also flows out of the lake. That shows it a little bit more, you know, how it actually happens in nature is that the water table can be elevated on one side. And so groundwater is going in and now let's write the out because that groundwater. Water is also flowing out as groundwater. Um, if it's the rainy season, maybe there's more groundwater coming into the lake. If it's a drought, then it could be that uh, there's not very much coming in, but water is continuing to seep underground. And this is a big problem they have uh, in Arizona. In, in the United States, there's a very dry, hot state called Arizona, 
And for some reason, they decided to put a lot of farms in the central and south of Arizona, where there's hardly any water there. And so they have to take the water from the Colorado River, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, and they lose uh, almost a quarter of the water just seeps into the ground. And so it's very inefficient. And so you can have water coming in and out through the groundwater. How else do we lose water out of that control volume? Good. Evaporation. All right. And then it looks like we've got both a stream and a river. What's the difference between a stream and a river? It's semantics, really. It just means uh, stream is usually the word that we use for a small river. So they're the same thing. It's just a river is big, a stream is small. A lake is big, a pond is small. Same kind of an idea. Did we miss anything? I think that's all of the flows in and out. So if we wanted to, we could represent this lake as a box. We could say, here's our lake, even though the lake really isn't shaped like a box. That's OK. What we're doing here is a schematic diagram. It just it represents the system in a more simple way if we don't have to draw the exact shape of the lake. So we have mass flowing in, mass flowing out. So there's a river in, there's a river and a stream out. Losing water in and out. Uh, there's the groundwater movement. There's evaporation. So this is an example of how you could draw a diagram for mass balance. And in your homework, I ask you to prepare a diagram. In the, uh, the homework assignment, yeah, problem four. Draw a simple diagram of this problem. This is the idea. It's, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a beautiful painting. It can just be like lines and concentrations. It can be very simple, but still help us keep track of what's happening. I like to see like maybe a graph of something just to make it easier to understand. Okay, so we've been talking about accumulation, but we haven't yet thrown the uh, time component in. We're just talking about in and out. But how much in and how much out per hour or per second? And so the word rate is talking about how changes occur over time. Do you have this in your slides? I made some changes to, uh, oh yeah, it's here, right? Yeah, yeah, it'll animate. Here's the formula. All right. So DMDT means the change of mass inside of our control volume over time. So the units for that would be kilograms per second for example, or it could be pounds per day, whatever mass per time units we use. And so we can apply the same in minus out approach if there's time in the denominator there. So it's just applying units of time is what makes it rate. And so let's do an example where we take a look at a sewer that's acting as our control volume. And in this example, they are proposing a new development. And this is actually a big problem in a lot of places where they have an existing sewer. It's been there a lot of years. And now they want to put in more houses, more apartment buildings. And they're trying to find out if the existing sewer can handle all that extra water that's going to be flowing in there. And so this analysis is kind of a real world question that gets asked pretty often. Um, the capacity of the sewer is four cubic meters per second. What determines that? You know, you don't just, I mean, it's not like sewers come with a label on the side that say the capacity. There's a lot of factors that affect how much water a pipe can carry. Do you remember open channel flow from fluid mechanics and water resources? What are some of the, what are some of the things that influence that? Okay, diameter is a really big one. The diameter of the pipe, you calculate the cross-sectional area, so that's a big one. Okay, friction, yep. So if it's a, a smooth, like a plastic pipe, 
you can have a higher capacity than it's a rough corrugated pipe because the, uh, the roughness will slow down the flow. Very good. Are there other factors as well? There's one more big one. Okay, but what's the, you're right, what is the velocity depending on? Distance over time. That's the definition of velocity, but what, um, okay, the outlet size, that's kind of the same as the diameter unless the outlet size is smaller than the pipe. And then you're right, if there was a difference there, then you could be choking the flow. I'm going to write a formula on the board. Let's see if I can do it from memory. It's been all summer long since I thought about this formula. Okay, it's Manning's equation. Q equals area divided by the end value and then the wetted perimeter, area divided by the hydraulic radius to the two-thirds power S to the one-half. I think that's Manning's equation. Does that look familiar to you guys? Okay. What a relief. What's that? Slope, right. So on this, it looks pretty steep, right? That's probably not really that steep. If it was that steep, the sewer would be going so deep underground they could never get the water out again. But it's just a diagram to show us. And so the capacity of the pipe is partly due to the roughness, which was already mentioned, the end value. It's partly due to the diameter of the pipe, which goes into both the area and the hydraulic radius, and then the slope as well. So once you have the pipe in the ground, you can't change any of those things, not easily. You know, once it's an existing pipe, you can't make it steeper, you can't make it bigger, you can't change the material without some work. So what we have is there's already a flow of one cubic meter per second and another flow of 0.5, point, uh, 2.7, and then the new one, the new one that they're asking about, would contribute a peak flow of 0.7 cubic meters per second. So if you have your calculator, why don't you do a quick analysis there if that's going to be OK or not OK. So what is going to be the flow rate into that pipe during the peak flow? Okay, 4.9 cubic meters per second. Awesome, right? Everything's fine? We should say yes to the new development? Why not? Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, sewers are gravity flow, which means most of the time the sewer isn't full. You know, like on the average day, there's just a little bit of water in the sewer. Here's the water, and here's the air. It's only occasionally that you have the peak flow. It's like at 8 p.m. when everyone's taking a shower, doing dishes, flushing the toilet, and then it's a rainy day, and so water is coming into the top of the manhole covers. It's only the, once in a while that you have the peak flow through there. But if you have 4.9 coming in, wanting to come in, but the pipe can only carry four, what it ends up doing is it ends up backing up. It'll, the sewage will back into the streets, it gets into people's yards, into the basement of their house, and then they're, they're pretty unhappy about that, as you might expect. This is a big problem in the town that I'm from, Huntington, West Virginia. Um, it's a very old town, and they put in the sewer 100 years ago, and it's the same sewer now that it was 100 years ago, but now there's so many more people that um, if, if you live in a low-lying area on a rainy day, you're really crossing your fingers that the sewage doesn't back up into the basement. So, all right. Any questions about this little illustration? All right. 
Well, what we're going to do for the rest of our class period is um, I have an in-class exercise that will prepare you for some of the homework problems. And uh, does everyone have a copy of the in-class exercise? All right. I'd like you to get together with a partner. You need one? Generally, what I'll do is I'll put all of the uh, notes for the day and the in-class exercise at the, uh, front of the front of the classroom. Yeah? No, that's fine. <clears throat> OK, so work with a partner. And um, this is the same idea with mass balance combining with one other idea. Last time, I told you about mass flow rate. I'm going to give it a new variable today to make it easier. All right, mass flow rate. We're going to call it m dot, and it is the volumetric flow rate times concentration. I just wanted to give you that idea. All right, so get with a partner. I'll be walking around with the answers to check your work, and you can ask questions as you're, as you're working on it. All right. By the way, here's a nice picture of that river. You, you don't get an idea of what it looks like until you uh, really see it in person, but this is, I guess, something. Um, from the image, I can see it better here on this screen than you can, but the rivers do look different. The, uh, the Monongahela, the concentration of silt, 1,500 makes it have a you know, like visually perceptible difference in appearance. It's, it, the water looks more brown. And silt is just really like it's similar to clay particles. You've probably all taken geotechnical engineering before. Back in the soils lab, you've de dealt with all the different soils. But when the water is flowing um, on river banks that erode very easily, then it takes some of the soil with it. And when raindrops fall in a watershed, and the soil is moving along from the raindrops, like it causes the erosion, then the, then the soil is carried by the river. And so this watershed, the watershed for the Monongahela, um, the soils are more easily eroded. So there's, you can actually look at the difference. And then when the two come together in the Ohio River, for several miles, it's sort of swirled, like the mixing. It's like um, if you have an ice cream where there's both chocolate and vanilla. You know, it's, it's similar to this. It's like the swirl kind of a thing. So um, this type of problem solving, you'll see so many times problems like this. And um, I created the in-class exercise so that it's step by step. You have exactly what you need. Usually, the problem isn't given to you in steps like that. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways to solve it, I think what most people did in the end was concentration is the mass flow rate divided by Q. And so the concentration in the Ohio is the mass flow rate for the Ohio divided by Q for the Ohio. Okay, so the mass flow rate for the Ohio River was 775 kilograms per second. And then you found that the flow rate is 800 cubic meters per second. And so if you multiply that by 1,000 uh, grams per kilogram, then that's where 696 grams per cubic meter came from. Okay. The other way to solve it is like this. You can solve these very quickly. If, if you just say the concentration of the Ohio is QA times CA plus QM times CM divided by QA plus QM. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I reverse it? Oh, thank you for catching that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right, 969, I had it backwards, thank you. All right, 
Anytime I make a mistake like that, please let me know so I can correct it as quickly as possible. All right. So back to this idea. This puts all of the steps into one equation because here is the mass flow rate for the Allegheny. Here is the mass flow rate for the Monongahela. And then here is the sum of the flow rate. So this gives us the flow rate of the Ohio River. So it combines step A, B, C, uh, and it, it, it combines all of the steps into, into one expression. So we would do it like this, 340 times 250 plus 460 times 1500 divided by 340 plus 460. Okay, so try that. See if we get the same answer. I hope so. Everybody has calculators, right? Okay. Let's go through and do this calculation, see what you get. Comes out as the same? Same answer? All right. So again, we get the concentration of silt in the Ohio is 969 grams per cubic meter. Sorry, 964. 964? Hmm. Well, I think maybe maybe you typed it a little bit different because it, it should be 969 it'll be the same I think yeah. um, all right one thing I'll mention is that uh, on the homework assignment I asked you to uh, to box your answers or did I not? well I'll tell you now on the uh, when you're doing your assignment be sure that your final answer put a box around just to make it easier for the grader to find. Um, and then uh, one other thing is, let's say that we have this same problem with the river, but a different unknown. So, okay. Okay, so here's the Allegheny, the Nongahela, and the Ohio. Okay, the water goes like this. So we have QA, CA, QM, CM, and then QO, CO. This one, what was known was the concentration of the Monongahela and the Allegheny. So what if it's given the other way around? What if we have, we'll use the same flow rates, we'll use um, Okay, what if it's 800, 340, and 460, and this is different from the example we worked before, but what if it was given that the concentration here is 1,200, the concentration here is 800, and the concentration here is unknown? This is more close to what the homework is. So, how are you going to be able to find the concentration of that unknown silt load in the Monongahela? Okay, so it's the same idea of the mass flow rate in equals the mass flow rate out. So we know the out and we know one component of the in and so we can write it like this. The mass flow rate of the Ohio is the mass flow rate of Monongahela plus the mass flow rate of the Allegheny. And the unknown here is the mass flow rate of Monongahela. And so we'd say mass flow rate of Monongahela is Ohio minus Allegheny. And then what is the definition of mass flow rate? volumetric flow rate Q times the concentration. And so QM, CM, 
And so we would have mass flow rate Ohio, mass flow rate Allegheny. So if what we wanted to find was the concentration of M, CM is going to be mass flow rate difference divided by the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate of the Monongahela. So it's just we're rearranging this same equation to solve for whichever unknown we've got. Oh, so you've solved it already. All right. Very good. 1496? 1496. It would have to be somewhere, but it would have to be higher than this, right? Because it would be a blend of the two. All right. Before we uh, break for today, um, I'm going to collect that in-class exercise. Be sure that you've written your name on it because that's how I am taking role for today. And let's take one last look at these announcements here. If you uh, we pass those forward so I can get them, the uh, in-class exercise, just pass them to the front of the classroom. By the way, we've rearranged the chairs a little bit. Will you please get those back into rows again yeah. before you leave? Already in here. Do I have all the in class exercises? Thank you. Okay, so remember um, there's nothing you need to submit for class next time. The assignment isn't due until Tuesday, but you should definitely get an early start on the homework. All right, I'll see you on Thursday. Here's the in-class exercises from last time if you want to collect your paper. Yeah. Uh, I get it from mass flow rate Ohio is mass flow rate Allegheny plus mass flow rate Monongahela. So, If you substitute this into each of these and then solve for the concentration of the Ohio. Oh, okay. All right. But do they have the same, according to this, that means they have the same concentration, like three times Q times A. Like they would have the same concentration. Mm, I don't think so. I think you add the two flow rates together okay. because the, the river is mixed. After they mix, then the combined stream has one continuous concentration. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm an exchange student, mm -hmm. and our exam is scheduled after my semester at home starts. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you were um, considering letting me take it early, like if we could work something out so that I would be able to yeah. time. Mm -hmm. I have like a letter. Okay. Yeah. Um, why don't you stop by my office sometime and we'll pick a date on the calendar that works for both of us. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, sir, this uh huh. Is my uh huh. Okay. Yeah, it's on the table at the beginning of class. All right. Thank okay. you. So, yeah. Uh, mm hmm. I have office hours on Thursday. Yeah. Okay. All right. No. In fact, it's better if it's not. <laughs> If you, uh, if you can get it to me today, before I leave my office, then I'll accept it and you can get the points. Mm, you're busy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. All right.